Bueno. Thank you very much. Uh, privileged to be here and meet so many wonderful people. Uh, I've already run out of time because I'm going to talk forever, so um, I better hurry up. Uh, okay, so look, I stand in front of you more or less having served personally about three million plates of food. Uh, it's back-breaking stuff, uh, and as a chef, I've been around the world a couple of times and worked some amazing kitchens with some amazing chefs. Uh, so first and foremost, I am a chef. Uh, I've cooked everything from brains to bulls. <laughs> and unfortunately, there's not that many brains in the kitchen, but a lot of bulls. Uh, I've worked in a lot of successful restaurants. I've opened two of my own restaurants, which have uh, been winning awards for, for a couple of years now. Uh, they're doing very, very well. And uh, recently, uh, I've opened a, a supermarket called the People's Supermarket, which has won five retail awards in, in six months. So um, whatever I'm doing, uh, seems to be getting people to listen. Uh, and I think that I've been creating, and I've been told I've been creating, disruptive technologies. And these are businesses that ask questions and push the, push the boundaries a little bit further, well, much further, I'd like to think. Uh, and in that, people tend to focus towards them because they say, well, I'm looking for answers, uh, and this seems to be a little bit more in flux than the regular restaurants. Over the past three years, I've visited hundreds of farms. I've been uh, out fishing in the Atlantic Ocean. I've been, I've been in a gale of wind, or so I've been told, Gale Force 10, uh, trawling for fish. Uh, that's pretty scary. Um, and in the past year, I've had two culinary mentors die, Rose Gray from the River Cafe and Sue Miles, two ladies who are instrumental in, in the reason why I'm here. Uh, and in that passing of generations, I've come to realize that I myself am becoming the next generation of chef that's teaching and uh, you know, taking on students and um, trainees and uh, you know, being a mentor for, for young people in the food industry. Um, but I'm not really here to talk about all of that. Uh, I'm here to do the do. Uh, and before I start on that, I, I've, I've been told to bring a book, but I'm never dealing with just one book. I'm dealing with about this many books at the same time. Uh, uh, and this pretty much is what influences me uh, in praise of shadows. You probably uh, uh, read it. Uh, John Milton's Paradise Lost, which is uh, potentially uh, where we're going. Uh, An Environmental History of Britain, borrowed from the RSA. Uh, the Concise Herbal Encyclopedia. Very rare. If anybody wants to look at it, please do. Um, Creating Sustainable Cities, uh, Herbert Gratia. Uh, this book is super rare, and, and uh, you can see the covers falling off. I found this in an Italian bookshop. Uh, the Italian cookbook truly is. Uh, the Great Dao. Um, I'm, uh, I'm a recovering Buddhist. I'm actually Taoist now. Um, uh, and I'm trying to read this uh, Far From the Madding Crowd by uh, Thomas Hardy. So um, those are my books. Uh, maybe I'll move them down because I can use them to rest my talk on. Now, usually I wander about the stage and talk very freely about the restaurants and the supermarket that I've created. Um, but I've kind of taken a do- uh, idea, which was, you know, think of something that, uh, or, or to talk about something that you're thinking about or haven't quite done yet, or, or push the boundaries of what you want to talk about. And I've done that. Um, so I kind of have to read it a little bit. So please excuse me if I look down uh, a little bit. Um, this is a kind of an essay that I've written down. I didn't know what I was going to talk about until about two days ago. And then I suddenly just went <laughs> straight out and came out to the computer and printed it off. And now I'm reading it. And uh, hopefully it works. Um, but this is basically a free flowing thought. Uh, onto the page. Uh, right. Food permeates every part of our global human community and our fundamental requirement and desire to eat and not go hungry has led us to a point of food chaos. Having spent 25 years cooking in some of the world's finest restaurants and most expensive restaurants, I've cooked food at the tables of the elite, nearly three million plates of it. Uh, where cost is no barrier to both the financial and the economic part of the food. But eight years ago, I, I began to ask questions of the food industry. And, and the first chance I had, I opened and created my first restaurants um, because I was looking for answers that I couldn't find elsewhere. And I thought, well, I've got to, I've got to get these answers from somewhere, so I better do it myself. Uh, and, and then to make changes in the kitchens, I, I started to make demands and change ideas within the kitchen 
how can I say, hierarchical structure, food structure, purchasing structure, and try to make it more holistic. I began to comprehend the way I cooked as something intimately connected to the whole cycle of food. From soil, to the seed, to the person who tends the plant, to the insects who are busy pollinating it. Everything in the food chain is interconnected and explicably linked. I want to positively influence all of the factors required to produce a plate of food. At the top of every page I've written breathe. So. <laughs> <laughs> so <I'm laughs> in my Arthurian quest, uh, I have become an accidental ecologist, which in turn has led me to look at the social benefits of food and how communities are a very powerful tool for driving food localism and stable food systems. Also referring uh, to the, the first talk, communities also really do heal loneliness because if you consider the table of people all sharing food, it really is not a lonely feeling. So I've become what I constantly do. Ecology for me is not an act, it's a belief. I'm not interested in saving the planet. I think she'll be fine, maybe in 100,000 years, but she'll be all right. I'm much more interested in saving the human, because I think it's us who are in trouble. Bob Marley sang about food, clothes, and shelter, and that they should be a prerequisite for every human being on this planet. But while some eat, others starve. The clothes on our backs demand child labour and pollute the planet. And our homes consume vast amounts of unsustainable energy and would not function, we would not function, without fossil fuels. Pollution and bad practice, however, is nothing new. Uh, it's been going on for centuries. Uh, in 1868, the Calder's River water uh, was used as ink to write a letter of complaint to the government to say, listen, this river's so bad, I can use the water to write with. And, and you can see it in the book, it's here, there's a, there's a, there's a uh, page of it. Uh, so our rivers were clogged with animal intestines, human excrement, tanning residues. You know, we were wrecking our food and, and our, our, our sort of natural inhabit uh, habitat around us. This created deadly choked up waterways, and it killed thousands and thousands of people in this country. But was that wanton disregard 800 years ago? This is the 12th century I'm talking about. Uh, or was it plain ignorance? Who was to blame 800 years ago when the future stood vast and mystical? Before science allowed us the insight that we have today. This planet 800 years ago was all-powerful, unconquerable. And if we misused it, which happened, it was usually locally, and it therefore remained a local problem and may have affected someone 200 miles away. But, you know, the world's getting smaller. Uh, the population is growing, and a fantastic, fascinating talk earlier on about where that uh, population is going to get to. Uh, and, and the local industrialization of nations in Asia and South America, uh, is, I think, is going to have an impact on us right here in this forest, because it's on a vast scale. But who are we to judge those people? Because 200 years ago, we went through our own revolution based on fossil fuels. So my idea for today is to create a new industrial revolution. A revolution based on the mistakes that we have made over the past thousand years. There has to be an era of experimentation in something as radical as a new industrial revolution so many new technologies are being created. I mean, we saw these fantastic you know, solar panels going up. I mean, brilliant, absolute genius. 
Um, yeah, state-of-the-art knowledge and, and, and what we've now got in our hands, we need to be using. We have made so many mistakes in the arena, the global arena of food. But success, as we talked about, is the result of making these mistakes and learning from experience. And I ask, to the room and beyond, do we have to do the same job now, knowing what we know? Can we change our methods, still to get the same outcome, but perhaps have a, a less ecological impact? 200 years ago, as we industrialised, uh, the methods may well have only been the only solution, but we have to learn from the mistakes that we made then. So we actually have to look back to move to the future. So kind of back to the future, one of my favourite movies. So this talk is, is, is a, more about looking for solutions rather than problems, because that's what I do. Uh, and I would like to discuss the present and the future rather than the environmental negatives that got us here. And I'd like to use uh, the history of ecological mistakes to view the future and to force change into every element of the food system. I've been thinking and meditating on a few ideas uh, and an important step for our food production is to begin to develop carbon sequestration. And that's the next idea for my next restaurant is carbon-based restaurant, but we won't go into that. Uh, we need to start locking carbon back into our ground and we need to get living carbon back into our, you know, into our land. I want to experiment with the capacity to predict the impact that a future business will have from an, eco an ecological standpoint. I'd like to shorten that sentence a little bit to predicting the ecological impact of a business or pre-ecology, predicting the ecology of a business. Surely we should be able to predict every possible outcome of our action with regards to design, manufacture and building. Every possible outcome of planting and harvesting and distributing and consuming and throwing away. We're at the pinnacle of the information age. We've got graphs, we've got analyses, we've got pie charts. I started so young in the kitchens, I was 16. I thought a pie chart was a poster of pies. <laughs> oh, look at that, oh, pork pies. Uh, I was not very good at maths, so pie charts I didn't get. Um, so, pre-ecology, pre-ecology. The next stage of design uh, is to predict ecological issues before they arrive. Uh, this uh, could be provided by solutions and in antiquity. The Egyptians, the Minoans, uh, water, people, gravity. But at the heart of the ecological movement, there must be a fundamental desire to do what we believe to be right. And I found that there is a sense of ethics where people try to create an alternative ecological solution to food production and consumption. I've come across this in the past three years. And in those ethics prevails a sense of localism. And in that localism agenda, there comes an understanding of energy use and a desire to create the maximum yield for a community as a whole, rather than individuals. It takes in investment to create this sort of infrastructure and the importance of social, community and ethical investment can change the way business is done. It's important that we invest in these social businesses, community businesses. Pre-ecology requires an improvement in the education system and this must be a priority. Students must first be taught how to live or taught how to live better. One of the most important issues for the future is to create an eco-vocabulary. And it needs to be understood by 95% of the population. Because at the moment, it only seems like 5% of the people are really getting and understanding the facts that the world is changing. We need to understand uh, and, and create changes on how we grow food and consume food. Organic shouldn't be for the 5%. It should be for the 95%. We need to articulate a narrative for the people. 
and make it relevant to government and NGO mandates. Uh, using tools like Sustainable Communities Act, um, it begins there with uh, local people knowing best what needs to be done for their area. But sometimes people need to be able to get into the, the government and get them to act and ask them to do things that we want them to do. I think the welfare system, the food system and the health system should be combined. Health, welfare and food, they are interlinked. And using all of those together should provide a holistic example for the future of this country and beyond. Because I'm talking about creating a new industrial revolution that gives answers to people who are industrializing on fossil fuels. We need to say, do you know what? We did that 200 years ago. And look what we found. And look where we're moving towards. Let us give you some examples of the new industrial revolution. And I think Britain would be super powerful if we could come up with the new industrial revolution. Because 200 years ago, when we were becoming great, fossil fuels, you know, we consumed them at this level, but now the world is consuming them at that level. So if we, as a large community, i.e. a country, uh, can show examples of best practice, this, in turn, will help developing nations act sustainably. I believe that food is the perfect vehicle, vehicle the perfect catalyst for change. Working cooperatively, working cooperatively within a community enables us to understand the value of food. Group buying allows for resource efficiency. Architects need to design greener. Governments need to push through changes. Chefs must demand higher levels of awareness, provenance, supply chains, etc. Economic growth is likely to go on, but we must design and build into that growth answers for the future. Proposing drastic measures like halting economic progress and cutting population growth to avert the danger of e ecological negligence is one thing, but trying to deliver that is another. Over a century of slowly rising real income, this has raised expectations, and the poor may well feel cheated if we don't allow them to grow. Almost certainly, though, your average person will not be quick to tighten their belts for the sake of the future generations. They won't tighten their belts because they're worried what a future generation is going to say about, oh, they weren't that good, oh, it doesn't matter. So a little poem. When long years hence the oil fires burn low, who will praise our spendthrift ways or fondly dwell on our failed banking show? I'd rather work with the future and begin to create a platform that our children can build on. We need to close the gaps in the food chain. We need to make lasting and sustainable connections with each part of the food chain. Is it worth it? Well, this talk hopefully goes some way into empowering new communities and old communities to work in localised groups in a sustainable manner. Mahatma Gandhi said that all we can do in life is to make sure that we play our own part the best way we can. Much as we would like to do more than that, it's impossible. Everything we do is so complex and it relies for its ultimate completion on so many different people and natural forces that we can never take full responsibility for the final outcome of our actions. But we can, we can take responsibility for the actions themselves. So, I say, if you do your worst to this planet, then we will do our best. Thank you.